You are listening to the Married Gamers Podcast. My name is Kelly Brown, and on this episode, Chris and I will interview Manbeer Hare from Bioware about his recent talk at GDC about video games addressing social injustice, and maybe a little gushing about how awesome Mass Effect is from Chris. All this and more on episode 330 of TVG Podcasts. Hello and welcome to the Married Gamers. I am one of your hosts, Chris Brown, and this is episode 330, recorded on March 27th, 2014. Thank you so much for listening to us. Uh, yes, we have a very special guest with us tonight. We have Manver Hare. He is a gameplay designer at BioWare, and uh, he gave a great speech from from all all accounts who who were present. Uh, at at, JD, at GDC, so we wanted to uh, have him on the show and uh, talk about about the speech and how not only uh, how that it went and how what the response is, but we as as uh, gamers how we can uh, be involved as well. So uh, thank you so much for joining us, Manveer. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Chris and Kelly. And we're gonna put you on the spot like we uh, like we do each and every episode. We uh, lead off with an opening question, and uh, this week. Uh, the opening question is, what one game do you wish you could play as a VR-enabled video game? This is, you know, we're talking vi- virtual reality, you know, and uh, so, Kelly, yes. we're going to lead off with you. Well, okay, this might sound very strange because of what I chose, but um, I'm going with probably my old standby. And no, it's not Buggy Bunnies, <laughs> um, but my old standby by uh, Bayonetta, because you know what? I want to be a badass motherfucking kick-ass woman <laughs> you can actually you know of course i'm afraid i probably might break everything in the house and myself doing all those moves but okay. anyways i think it'd be cool i'm just trying i'm back i'm i'm sort of thinking you didn't how, play what that would, uh, yeah i'm just trying to conceptual conceptualize how that would work it's how tons of fighting now the only bad thing is, is you're like flying all over the screen exactly <laughs> And just hopefully, you know, my clothes just don't all fall off and my hair becomes my weapon. And yeah, you know. Okay. So note to self, <laughs> uh, this, that may replace my, uh, my favorite moments during Dance Central. <laughs> all right. So, anyway, uh, for, what about you, hun? For me, um, I'm, I'm going to go with, and I, I know it sounds a bit corny. And, and yes, I have to admit, Mass Effect was on that list. Like, oh, that would be so cool. But, more than anything, I, w- I want to have Plants vs. Zombies. Wait, so you know, your Mass simple... Effect was on there? Yeah, yeah. So that means that you would be getting with an alien? Oh, gosh. You know what? No. That's you not why. <laughs> That's not why. You can't have a Mass Effect on there. Gameplay. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> Wait, no, so but, here. But I, no. I do believe that you tried to romance everyone in. Was that's it? part of the fun. Yeah, I know. That's so, part of the fun. Yeah, exactly. I believe uh, that's but, the official but, correct way to play Mass Effect, by the way. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Plants vs. Zombie. I think uh, you know having that sort of spatial, you know, uh, level play, you know, almost like a football field type environment where you're placing plants before the zombies. And so then, are you like, are you chucking the peas, no, or no, are you just no, planting? It's, it's still, you know, oh, RTS. Still you're, you're placing things, but being seeing the zombies come at you. Uh, no, thank you. In in your field of vision versus from up above, I think I think it'd be a lot of fun. Okay, apparently, I'd rather see knives and other flying angels at me rather than zombies. Because <laughs> no, thank you. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have Manveer. What would what would be the game that you would want to see? Yeah, or, and play. Uh, I was just thinking about this, and so I mean, I've tried the Oculus, uh, you know, which obviously just got bought by Facebook. I see you, so big news this week. Um, the cool thing I thought about it was that, like, when you turn your head, right, you actually can see diff- – it's like turning your head in real life, right? You're getting a different angle. And so I think, like, a Wing Commander game or really any space, uh, of, like, fighting game would work really well there because then you can actually kind of take advantage of the whole, like, looking over your shoulder to see who's behind you 
uh, trying to actually use like the cockpit like like properly uh, as you're playing it. So an updated or a next wing commander or or other uh, space sim, I would say. Kelly, uh, tell the yes. folks where they where we can be found. So you can find the Married Gamers at various places on the internet. You can find us online at www.themarriedgamers.net, Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Married Gamers. Follow us on Twitter at Married Gamers. Also, you can follow Lefty at Lefty Brown or myself at Mrs. Lefty Brown. Uh, we have an official Twitch TV channel, which is Official Married Gamers. Search for it. Um, I think that now that Twitch is working on the Xbox yeah, One, you're we're probably going to see a lot of uh, Titanfall yeah, on there. You're going to see a lot of Titanfall. You might see some uh, Plants vs. Zombies, Garden Warfare being and, played on there. And uh, probably me playing on very, very easy, uh, some some matches, uh, Liver- Liverpool FC in uh, FIFA. There you go. Yeah. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments that come up throughout this podcast or about former podcasts or anything in general, email us at Married Gamers at Outlook.com. And we'd like to thank our sponsors, Tioga Sequoia. You can find them at tioga sequoiacom uh, Maker of they they make some excellent craft brew here in the Central Valley, and uh, they have a they have a seasonal limited one out called uh, Rush Hour, which is oh. a breakfast stout. So yummy! And uh, it is absolutely fantastic. And uh, yeah, so I may have. Uh, been tempted to drink it in in the morning and have you really and well, well you know with uh with these uh british premier league uh games you oh, know being okay. in england you know it's like some some games are like at four or five o'clock in the morning it's been tempting <laughs> it's i mean i tempting. don't see how it would be a problem personally <laughs> well and the neat thing is this beer was brewed with a local uh coffee maker mm-hmm. as be- uh, beans and so it's like all local yeah so so stuff. if you're so anywhere between L.A. and San Francisco, uh, be on the lookout. Uh, limited batches are, are out there. So, All right. So big thank you to Taiga Sequoia for sponsoring the show. It is time for the Week in Geek. And I'm always, I, I'm always excited when we have a guest, and especially someone who works in the industry, to see what they've been doing cool in you know, what they've been watching, what they've been playing, what they've been reading. And uh, I'm sure Manvir's going to impress us. So, you know, no pressure. <laughs> So it's a weird thing about working in video games is that I don't get a chance to play many video games or I'm so exhausted often that I have not played a ton of video games lately. So coming back from the conference, I haven't really played many games, haven't watched a lot of new TV that's not like chopped. But I did go out and see a movie this week that I loved. Uh, I saw The Grand Budapest Hotel by Wes Anderson. So he did uh, The Fantastic Mr. Fox and the Royal Tenenbaums and The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. There are people who love Wes Anderson, and there are people who hate Wes Anderson, and I think there's nobody in the in-between. Um, I love him. He's, he has this whimsical, beautiful, kind of wonderful way of presenting the world. It's funny. It's it's kind of cute at the same time. This movie is actually gory in a Wes Anderson way, and I don't know how to explain that without saying you'll know it when you see it. Like, um, But yeah, you know, I really enjoyed The Grand Budapest Hotel. It really lived up to all of his style and uh, his st- kind of movies. Uh, so I'm really enjoying that. Uh, other in the game, games, I've been trying to get back into the uh, Double Fine. Um, uh, what's the name of the adventure game that they, they just released? Sorry, my brain is completely failing me right now. Uh, yeah, but but the Double Fine adventure game. I'm uh, uh, sorry, Broken Age. Uh, I, I was playing that before I started doing my talk prep and everything, and I just been I had to stop playing all games to get that done. And then uh, Octodad, Dadly as Catch. Uh, I just picked up, and so you know, I, I want to get a chance to play that that ridiculousness because who doesn't want to be a dad dressed like or an octopus dressed like a, a father slipping around town? True, very true. true. Although I, I would posit that uh, uh, April first, we'll all be wanting to play goats in when Goat Simulator comes. Are you sure it's really coming out, and it's not just an April Fool's joke? Oh, it, it better come out. It looks awesome. It looks like so much like mindless fun. Will it be, anyway, will it be uh, Surgeon Simulator is the question, as the most ridiculous of all the simulators out there. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? I still, I, we, I still have not played that. Uh, it it is that. impossible to play. Like, you watch somebody play it on YouTube, and you're like, oh, that looks great. You try to play it. It does not play. You're like, what? Yeah, and actually, it's on iOS now, Kelly, so you might want to give that Ooh. a try there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, I think that's all I've been like. I, I, frankly, I've been catching up on a lot of sleep, too. <laughs> that's, that's my week in geek sleep. What about you, Kelly? Um, so I, you know, last week I said that I finished up, uh, Krista Charter's newest book, uh, Griefed. And so I handed you my, uh, 
my uh, paper white. And I said, okay, pick me a book. And you picked, um, oh gosh. Yeah. The one which. Blink. <laughs> no, it's the one with the, he's writing about his story. A, a video game. A video game. Yes. Um, Why are we. <laughs> holy crap. <laughs> I should have written this in the show notes. It might have been helpful. Yeah, that's why. The, oh, there. hush at you. <laughs> um, anyways, I'm about two chapters into it mm-hmm. and enjoying it. It's an it's, excellent book, too. I wish. Yeah, extra you. Lives. Extra Lives, yes. Um, I was just thinking, he talks about how and he had an extra life in Fallout 3. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's called Extra Lives. So I've been enjoying that. It's Tom, Tom Bizzell. There you go. Okay. Then I have also been, um, for some reason or another, in a mood to watch a good TV cop show again. Oh, no. <laughs> and so, well, you you even said to me, you're watching? Let me guess. Adam 12? No, I already watched that. <laughs> um, oh, that's terrible of me to admit. Uh, no, you even said to me when you when I, you heard it in the bedroom that I was I was playing, you're like, you're watching that? I'm watching CSI <laughs> Miami. So, uh, you know, it's something to watch before I go to bed. I'm going between that and Sons of Anarchy still. Mm-hmm. Um, not that Sons of Anarchy, uh, Anarchy doesn't have my attention, but I have to be fully focus on Sons of Anarchy. Uh, the other one I don't have to focus on as much. And enjoying on the Food Network, there's a show called Cutthroat Kitchen. Oh, my gosh. You should watch this show, honey. Okay. Oh. So what happens is there's four chefs, right? And they go and they have, they're told, you know, okay, you're going to cook. And Alton Brown is the the host. I don't okay. know if you know who he is. I think I know. Who and they is. go, okay, so you have 30 minutes to cook the best BLT. And that's what they tell them. And so then they have to go, they have 60 seconds to go and get their shopping done out of this little refrigerator. But then they come back and then he has these sabotages. So it could be something as much as one of them was, um, they had to do all their cooking on a shovel. And so they bid and they have $25,000 and however much money, whoever wins, however much money they have left is how much they walk out with. So it's kind of interesting to see like how much somebody's willing to spend on sabotages and how they make a BLT without bacon or, okay. you know, those types of things they'll have taken away from. It's an interesting show. I think you would enjoy it. And right yeah. now, right I, I now, watch the Nick, Food Network. I, I watch the Food Network quite a bit. Have you seen Cutthroat Kitchen? I, I have. I will admit to hating the show. Really? Uh, yeah. So I love. Like, so I watch a ton of Chopped, which is like the. Oh, I love Chopped. So the reason I don't like Cutthroat Kitchen is because it's not a. It's not as much about like the cooking skill. It's more about how screwed over do you get and how do you adapt. Yeah. And the parts of Cutthroat Kitchen I like, which are basically seeing the interesting ways, like you mentioned. How do they handle the fact that they need to make a BLT without bacon, or how do they handle that the only like cooking source that they or they can't use like they can't taste their food or they can't uh, use a knife. Uh, to cut things. Th- those are interesting to see, but the actual, like, the kind of most scummy, bad, horrible people win that show, and I just kind of find myself not yeah. not enjoying that at all. You know, I'm sort of the same way. That's the reason why I, I despise, and I won't, I won't watch Hell's Kitchen. Yeah, you won't watch but, Hell's Kitchen. But I'll watch Master Chef Master because Chef, it's yeah. more positive in nature. Yeah, I, I'm exactly the same way. Uh, I, I'm actually a huge Gordon Ramsay fan, and I watched one season of Hell's Kitchen, and I'm like, I don't enjoy this at all. This is all the terrible stuff. Yeah. But yeah, Master Chef or his like or other cooking shows that are more like here's skill. Like the the most skilled will win, not the most devious or more uh, often more interesting to me. Any, anything else? Kelly? Um and yeah, and so um I have to admit with gaming, I haven't been doing tons of gaming because I've been spending two nights a week wrapping up TAing my H the HTML CSS class. Mm-hmm. And I learned some PHP. I was all excited. I learned some <laughs> PHP. I, I have to show you this. Like I can make I can make forms now. Yeah. Where it will I I know how to make forms so that it'll it'll actually send an email to you. Like people can put information into a contact form and it'll get sent to you. Okay. I think it's pretty cool that I learned how to do that. Next week you start JavaScript. And next week I start JavaScript. All right. And it's JavaScript. They broke JavaScript up into two. Uh, if you're local, it's at GeekWise Academy at Bitwise Industries. They broke it up into uh, JavaScript 1 and JavaScript 2 mm-hmm. because they found it was too much. But I have, up until then, up until now, been working on this website called CodeAcademy.com, and it can walk you through any language that you want to learn. Okay. So I've been taking JavaScript on CodeAcademy.com, and they gamified it. 
So as you're going along, you're like, you got a badge for whatever. <laughs> um, and you, they keep a streak count of how many days you've done Code Academy for. So there's the gamification add, oh, added cool. to it. That's cool. So, but if you ever have an interest in wanting to learn the basics of a language, CodeAcademy.com, it's free. All you have to do is sign up for it. So pretty cool. That's cool. So, yep, yeah, yep. What about you, Honey Bunch? Um, well, l- last weekend, I uh, sort of like opened up a, a, a vein, put some, or started taking fluids intravenously. And so I could just like hammer down and play Infamous Second Son. And I actually, from Friday to I think Sunday evening, um, I, I played from start to finish through the story. I'm still playing it because uh, it's one of those games that really hits. I mean, let me back up. I'm already a fan of the Infamous series, but as gameplay goes, this is that sort of gameplay is sort of like uh, really, really appeals to me. So, so you know, it, it's that sort of crackdown, find all the, you know, in this in this instance shards, you know, and you're and you get to not only have all these missions and you know really cool powers, but it's set in a really cool environment that you're not only just going from mission to mission, you're getting to see really, really cool stuff. You know, this sort of amalgam of, of Seattle, you know, brought to life in this, in this game. And, you know, it's, it's not, I mean, this is the first real game that people should, if they've been on the fence about getting a PS4, this is one of the first big steps saying, yes, this is, this is one of the reasons why Uh, it looks terrific. And uh, in fact, you were walking by during a cutscene of the other uh, yeah. One, one evening, and you were like, you thought I was watching a movie. Yeah, I did. I mean, there's some great moments, and you know, uh, for those who may not be familiar with the Infamous series, and but are attracted to to this title, uh, go for it because you won't need to know too much of the other two or know about the other two games. And there is a like a small, insane, little bit of like a uh, connection to the other games but it isn't in any way shape or form vital for for your for information and stuff like that so it's a good it's a good starting place and uh you know sucker punch just uh another another good solid enjoyable game and and uh also it uh, appeals to me on a you know that sort of gameplay in which you sort of have to choose what route good or evil you want to take and you know and some of the larger themes about uh you know how the, the 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 security state and our position as citizens in it, and uh, immigration. Well, not not so much immigration, but but the um, putting putting these people who have superpowers. You know, they they've sort of like uh, rounded up. You know, mm-hmm. so, uh, so some of those bit larger issues and stuff, and it's done quite well. Nothing too ham fisted, and nothing too nothing too uh, well. I had to I had to. Put li- wear my heart on my sleeve. Nothing too uh, conservative, you know. So, I I really enjoyed it. So, all right. Uh, other than that, uh, Titanfall, not too much because Second Son took up my time. But uh, I think I what may level are you at? I am at level forty four. I'm at level two. You'll you'll rank up. I know. TV wise, I've been watching Ashes to Ashes. It's a it's a BBC series, a sequel to. Uh, Life on Mars, and I loved Life on Not Mars, but I'm loving Ashes to Ashes even even more. Yes, honey. I just say every time you tell me that you're watching Ashes to Ashes, I want to walk through a room and go and dust to dust and walk away. <laughs> Is that horrible of me? <laughs> uh, so I'm in the final season of Ashes to Ashes, and and that's you know big revelations are happening, and you know it's it's really good show. I, I really enjoyed it, and uh, I'll I'll end on uh, my Weekend Geek with this. So Marvel has these trade paperbacks out, Marvel Comics, and of sometimes they do it for specific people who've who've have integral runs on comics. So they've done it for Peter David's run on Hulk, which was almost a decade, if not a decade. And uh, so and and uh, that's great stuff. So, but right now I'm reading Walter Simonson's run on Thor. And uh, if anyone isn't doesn't know about Walter Simonson, a uh, uh, great great artist, but he loves Norse mythology, and so this was sort of his dream project, and he really put an indelible stamp on Thor as a character. 
And uh, but it was one that I never got a chance to read so much back back on, during his run. So I'm very thankful that uh, Marvel is collecting it, and and uh, I've been enjoying reading it, and it's really good. Looks great. You know, it's still part of that '80s type uh, t- way of storytelling on, in a comic book. So there's a lot of thought balloons and and uh, a lot of uh, rehashing of the plot because that's one of those those things that you do in comics. That, to catch new readers up and stuff like that, but but all in all, it's still a very enjoyable uh, experience uh, to read through. So that is oh, and I, I I'm rereading the Lexi Cooper books too. So I'm now in the second book. So and you're gonna read the um the little mini series one, right? Too. Yeah, the little short. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's my weekend geek. Sounds good. All right. So man, veer hair. Um, that sounds like you're like gonna put them on like that. <laughs> you know, like so we're gonna we'll interrogate you. <laughs> explain, explain yourself. No, no. Uh, you gave it. You gave a talk, and you've given many talks at, at GDC San Francisco, and often on. Is there uh, more than one G- GDC? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, there's a GDC Europe and uh, GDC Austin? Next. Yeah, there's a GDC in Austin online and GDC Next in LA now for like app development oh, wow. and mobile. Um, but you, you've given talks before, uh, along often along the themes of of race, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. In uh, 2010, I did a panel at GDC called uh, "What Color Is Your Hero?" So I did it with uh, Lee Alexander, Jamin Warren of Kill Sc- who's now of Kill Screen, and um, Mia Consolva, who's an academic. Uh, we kind of talked about race in games and why why our heroes often like white men. So, but this year you you gave a talk about uh, well the title was misogyny racism and homo homophobia where do video video games stand and it it was it was not just a a, a talk uh, filled with facts but it was also a talk as a call to action and uh, uh, for folks who may have may not have heard about the uh, about the talk could you talk about uh, what what your your speech was about sure so really what I wanted to do was take a look at how we treat social issues in games and what are what are video games themselves not the culture around them being like uh, how do we act on Xbox Live or how do we treat women who want to make games because there's some very problematic things happening in that area that I don't want to dismiss but um, more concentrate on what the games themselves are doing uh, like do we have racist, homophobic, uh, misogynistic content in our games. Um, and just take a look at that, where, where kind of we stand as an industry. So I took a look. I, I did a lot of research, um, found a bunch of research papers, and I kind of started following the threads. I also just took a look at some of our common games, and what I really found was, um, by the numbers, we are way over-representing uh, white, uh, whites in the race uh, and men. So men make up about... I think it was 85% of our game characters, both primary and secondary characters, uh, versus like you know 15% for women. Uh, when obviously the the population is 50/50 in the U.S., so that's a huge underrepresentation. It's a massive one. Uh, in race, there were similar things where um, blacks, Latinos, Native Americans were uh, underrepresented groups, uh, as were Asians uh, compared to whites. Uh, even with the things like the the elderly and like children who are not often in games is always you know middle you know twenties and thirty year olds in, in games, um, and then I kind of drew threads to uh, media effects. So there's this concept called identity uh, formation basically that exists, and the identity that you have is kind of always growing and changing in social science. So basically, like what my identity is today might not be my identity in five years, um, and I kind of get the I have the ability as a human to change what my identity is. So you can look at studies that say basically your identity can be affected by the media. Um, So basically depicting, you know, uh, black characters as being uh, violent all the time in a a dangerous and illicit way and not like the heroes saving at war can actually cause, you know, the African in American community to view themselves more negatively in the broader scope of things. And so I brought numbers and research that all showed this to be uh, happening. And then I showed what our games are doing, which is we are failing. And I said, basically, we're contributing to this, the problem of the game. But also, we're not just doing like making a problem in culture of like we're not representing people. We're also just making the same boring games all the time, it feels like. Especially in AAA, where I work, with the big budget games. You know, the games a lot of you guys are we're talking about playing. 
like how often am I that same character uh, in a game who's like the stubbly faced brown hair kind of you know early 30s looking guy who's kind of a wise ass like I've played that character so many times and how many times does he save the universe so the whole talk was kind of a I said that logical framework for the problems exist they actually have impact there are studies um, one of the studies I quoted for example uh, basically split a group of men into two groups um half the men saw pictures of men and women like from stock photography that were dressed professionally in like suits the other half saw a picture of video game man and a video game woman the woman was a sex object and the man was like a powerful man so kind of created a a a gender dynamic and then both groups were read uh a an account of uh sexual discrimination uh sexual harassment excuse me uh of a female of a female college student by her male professor and asked to comment on it and it turns out the men who were exposed to the uh, wi- the video game sex object woman and powerful man, those men were far more forgiving and willing to like look away uh, and not be find problematic the sexual harassment than the people who saw the equal like the equal man equal woman picture. So literally, just a depiction of who people are and what we think of them in our head affects how we treat people and act. And so that was kind of the thread that I wanted to draw that this stuff matters. And, and here's this is not, I feel it matters. Here is clinical evidence that this matters. Um, and then also here, we're also making the same game too often. And this is also creatively boring and is going to cause a stagnation problem. And then here's steps that we can do to get better, which is basically start a conversation because it's a room of developers. So start a conversation amongst yourselves with your coworkers, find problematic things in your game and try to fix them. And like, don't give up when you hit resistance because you're going to. One other thing on on your uh, on on your speech that I, th- I thought was uh, sort of a revelation to me was uh, you know you you brought up uh, one some of the resistance to having more of these type of games, and especially games featuring a a, a, a female pr- protagonist, uh, and many companies shy away from that game. And you know, in case of point, uh, Tomb Raider, you know they you know, they sort of point well. You know, it's not going to sell as well as you know the next Call of Duty or stuff like that. And you actually had some uh, some good uh, comments. I was wondering if you could uh, uh, tell our audience uh, about that. Sure. Yeah. So uh, one of the frequent things that comes up is like you know uh, a women protagonist won't sell or a black protagonist won't sell. And um, the now defunct Penny Arcade Report did some research uh, and. November of 2012 with EEDAR, which is like a data research firm. And it kind of showed that uh, it was true that women characters sold less than men characters uh, and games that let you choose sold better than both of those. Um, However, it was also when you were an exclusive female character, you got like significantly less marketing spend and significantly less budget than the other games. And so my call was like, well, okay, if you want to point at that data, then that data is biased and that data is flawed. Like the amount of money I get to make my game impacts the quality of it. And the amount of money the marketing spends pushing my game impacts the, uh, the reach of it. And so we can't really cherry pick that data and say, yeah, well, that, that doesn't work because then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of, well, we don't make the game with women in them because they don't sell, but then they don't sell because we're not making the game with women in them. And this all turns up to be like ginned up on really flawed data. And I think it's more we're concerned. The real answer is we don't know. Like it's obviously possible that a game starring a woman can can sell well. Tomb Raider just or Square Enix just announced Tomb Raider sold over 6 million copies and was uh, like exceeded expectations financially. And you know, six million isn't the most in the world, but it's certainly a lot of copies and nothing to be scoffed at. And that, to me, is a kind of a stepping stone and a start. So, when you you know come up with uh, your talks that you're going to have in front of GDC, do you go with what is in your heart that you want to talk about and is in your passion, or is it you know I know that this is what's coming out within the video game realm within the next you know three to nine months, so this is where I'm going to go to kind of help. I guess, push the passion of the other people at GDC. I I found that often those two end up being the same thing. I'm a very uh, passionate person. I'm a very vocal person online, on Twitter, in the community. Like you said, I've given like 10 plus talks in the industry. Um, And I talk about what I care about. And, you know, this is one of those big things. It happens to also be a conversation that's happening in video game culture, especially lately, like the last couple of years. 
Um, and so that's kind of helped me keep, keep an eye on it, keep thinking about it, keep hearing what other people are saying. So I always talk about what I think is the most important thing, but I also thought, Hey, people are ready to start hearing this stuff now. Like you can tell that there's mo- there's a momentum or a tide shifting right now. It feels like, um, and this is becoming bigger and bigger and people are really starting to pay attention. And what better time than at the biggest conference amongst the most amount of game developers that you can collect in an area to give this sort of talk. Do you, do you find that, you know, obviously after you give the talk, there's, there's a lot of people that cover your, your, your talks. And so then it's out on the, the internet to people who weren't able to hear you converse live that, is being well received or are people questioning why you gave your talk? Um, I have, you know, I have a large following on Twitter and I've gotten a lot of comments on Twitter and they have been overwhelmingly positive. Um, at, at the conference itself, I mean, I know, I knew I had a good talk. I knew I had a talk that people cared about, but I didn't know people were going to show up or how they were going to receive like the logical side of the message and then the kind of impassioned play at the end. And, and I mean, I got a standing ovation and that's that's always humbling it, it's kind of amazing to, to see that people love it that much and then yeah you walk away and people start writing that up but that becomes kind of the narrative that ended up being kind of called out in all of these write-ups you know at polygon and and uh, game industry that biz and everything that they're mentioning like a crowd of people developers really stood up and cheered for this um and that means that they care and maybe that influences their narrative too i don't know it doesn't really matter to me but I found that most of the write-ups have been very positive as well, uh, at least the write-ups that were of people who were there. There are then write-ups of write-ups, which are just god-awful usually, which we won't even get into. Um, and then, yeah, everyone's been very positive to me. Now, if I go to those write-ups and I troll through the comments or I look at – I did an interview with Adam Sessler who used to be of X-Play and now runs Revision 3 Games on YouTube. I did like a 17-minute on-camera interview with him. If I read through those comments on YouTube, I'm sure I would hate myself. But that's why you don't read the comments. Everybody knows this. Like, don't like that's where the dregs of of thought are going to be. And but as for people actually attacking me or or saying that my my I I think I've received literally three negative comments of people directly coming at me on Twitter and saying I really disagree with you. And interestingly, I've received no threats. No one's attempted to like, threaten to rape me, to kill me. And frankly, if I were a woman and said the exact same message, there is zero chance that that is going to be true. You can look at other outspoken women in our industry and see the death threats, the doxing that's happened of their personal information being exposed. And that was kind of stark because I'm friends with a lot of these women who are outspoken. And like, I, I obviously, I have a, a massive amount of privilege of not being treated like that. But it also kind of saddens me because I, I start wondering, are people listening to this message more because of where I work and I'm a man? And I think that's part of it, to be completely frank. You know, some of that you can't change because you are who you are, but it's good that you are standing up and and speaking your mind all the same. Uh, I did want to just to ask about, so you know, in line with the reaction, the your, your speech was not only pr- uh, making your case and, and presenting facts and, and thesis, but it was drawing people to your cause. It was empowering people to stand up and make a difference. And, and so I was wondering, in terms of uh, making or affecting change in, in the industry, do you think that there is enough, pe- you know, the, the, the right type, type of people there that can, can actually affect change in their, their companies? You know whether that you know whether they're doing their own small small uh, indie gaming or if they are you know developers and they and they have to report back to the bosses. Is there is there enough sentiment there? Is there enough vigor for 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 change in the industry that that will that you think that will will see some of this uh, uh, come about? I mean, I certainly hope that I, I certainly think the right people were there, uh, the right types of people, the people that were had open minds, uh, you know, whether or they are, they already believed it or they were on the fence and they, they, I convinced them. Um, now as for actual change, I think we'll see some amount of change. I don't know if it, how much though. Right. I, I, I think this is a process. I don't think this is like, well, I'm done. Like we're going to be good from now on. Right. Um, All right. I think people are starting to think about these things. Really what my talk was about is understand why you default to something, right? Like, 
I, I was talking with a friend um, while I was at GDC. He worked on an indie game, and in the indie game, he hired an artist to kind of concept him a family, a, a mom, a dad, and a son. And he just said, can you concept me a family and told him what the indie game kind of was? And then they came back, and he got a white family, right? And in the artist's head, it was a white family. And in his head, it was a white family. But never did they ever actually say that out loud. That was defaulted. And so what my talk was about is if, the, if you want that to be with the, your game, that's fine. Just be cognizant of that. Like, don't to fall back on that default just because you had to. And I've heard anecdotally that people are hearing that message. I, I heard someone told me at GDC right after my talk, they overheard another group kind of basically going, hey, when we get back to the office, we should talk about this character in our game and fix this because this is a problem. And the other guy going, yeah, I agree. And I was like, hey, if that one person changed their game when they yeah. got back or had a discussion about it or at least started understanding their biases, like you didn't, they didn't even have to change anything. They could just question it. And the act of questioning it means you're cognizant and then you can make the right creative call. And that's really what I want people to do is question why they do things. Like question why you, you go, well, this character should be a male or this character should be straight. This character should be, you know, uh, white. Uh, um, and so I think that's slowly happening. Now, is everyone going to be able to go back and win? No. There's a, there's a lot of closed-minded people still. There's a lot of people who don't see this. There's a lot of people who actively push against this. And some of them exist in the industry itself and not just in the fans. Um, and so people will have differing amounts of success. But I'm confident that at any reasonable-sized company that you will find allies who believe in the same thing that you. So part of my call to action was find those people, have discussions, because frankly, more voices are more powerful than one voice, right? And so you start finding that group of people who, within your own organization, you can start having open discussions about these issues and then propose things as groups and you can stand up for each other. And I think that has the long-term effect of, of affecting change. Why is it that in other, other forms of media, uh, take, for instance, on television, you know, I, I, I like to use Star Trek as, as one of those uh, shows that sort of uh, made people think about things like such as racism, xenophobia, and, and, and the such. And, and we see in, in other forms of media, but when it comes to games, there, there are positive examples, but, uh, but by and large, uh, it's, it's more of that sort of white male you know what like you described earlier why is it games doesn't uh as a whole you know address those issues um i think there's a few things one i actually don't think we're that much worse than the rest of media i think most of media is pretty bad at this but i do think we're worse than uh film and tv uh and i just think there's a lot more film and tv out there right now and there's a larger history of it as well to draw upon so the numbers look skewed if they're not actually skewed um on top of that I think we're an industry that's very homogenous in our workforce. So that is, I work primarily with white men um, and most, most, mostly heterosexual men. And that is none of their own faults, right? But we are kind of drawing the same sorts of people into the industry. And when you do that, you have a very similar voice often that, that comes out. Um, and that taps into um, just kind of the cultural biases that we all collect. Uh, additionally, I also think video games are still relatively young and the narrative push in video games is a lot more recent that kind of started around i'm gonna say xbox one playstation 2 era maybe even ps1 like that's mm. when you started seeing like the kind of cinematic game uh, there was obviously some exceptions before that but like this whole idea of telling good stories in games is been growing kind of slowly and now we're at a point where a lot of our games really try to tell interesting good stories but i don't think we know or are equipped to uh do a good job at that yet because we don't we don't give it the same rigor we do to make the best cover system in a game or the best weapon in a game and i think we need to start calling that out and saying if this should matter to us if we're going to put so much effort into it and we should care and you can tell the companies that are succeeding really do like the last of us by naughty dog got a glad award for the depiction of bill who was you know he happened to be gay it was kind of just a, a trait of him it wasn't his his primary trait he wasn't big effeminate you know flaming he Mm -hmm. He just also happened to be attracted to men of the same sex. And you want that kind of representation because there are morally questionable, evil and good, you know, gay people and black people and Asian people and uh, trans people and everything in between. Um, and, and we all kind of make up that full swath. So I think games are behind um, in part because of the workforce thing, like I said, 
in part because we're scared a little bit and beca- part because we just don't know better. And part of my call was to like, well, here, you can't claim you don't know better. I'm telling you. Like, and I'm giving you evidence. I'm not just saying this from the heart. Here's evidence of why I'm, I, I can prove that this is an issue. What would be your response to the, to that con- contingent of gamers and, and others that would say, well, if you put all that stuff in, if, you inclu- if you're more inclusive, then my game's not going to be fun. Like, I'm not even sure where that a conversation comes from in terms of it's not going to be fun. Because the game doesn't have to be about let's all be fair and everything be socially harmonious, right? Like, the right. game could just depict characters that have different backgrounds. Again, why can't, why can't Master Chief be black? Well, he doesn't really have a face. But, okay, why can't Nathan Drake be black? Like, would that actually change the game at all if he just happened to be African-American? I don't think that changes that game at all. I think that game is still fun. Um, you know, Tomb Raider has very many Uncharted-like qualities to it in its gameplay, and it's very fun, and it's got a woman. So, one, I think that's a straw man argument. Um, mm-hmm. Two is the other argument ends up being that, like, well, um, I just want to play games. They're just fun. I don't want to think about these issues. And the thing is, for those of us who are not the majority, well, we want to do the same thing. But, like, we're not afforded the same ability to just go into a fantasy world and feel like I I can just fully invest in this fantasy world. Because in the fantasy world, well, I'm brown. Brown people are usually persecuted in the fantasy world. Uh, Women are usually prostitutes or like subservient to men really beneath the heel and in your everyday life when you're trying to just go into escapism of, of, of craft or of media and you're reminded of that stuff every day like it's hard to just escape on that and people who don't see that are usually ones in the majority and the rest of us deserve the right to be able to invest ourselves in fantasy constructs and, and, and have escapism there and i would like to see that more like that th- there's no reason we can't do that now um, so are there some games that you would say, you know, they're actually doing it right as we speak? Sure. Uh, yeah, a couple games I quoted in my talk. One was Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation, which was uh, originally on the Vita and I believe ported over to like Xbox Live or, uh, Xbox Live and like downloadable and uh, PlayStation Network. Um, and so it was, it was starring a um, biracial character named Aveline uh, in New Orleans. Uh, she's an assassin, for example, right? Um, but then basically as well as being an assassin, she comes from a biracial background of French and African ancestry, uh, and New Orleans at that time, if you don't know, was very, very, very diverse mixed, one of the craziest melting pots ever to exist in Western history. Um, and that game put some interesting game mechanics behind that. So basically you can change, you can go from assassin mode to what's called like late, like be acting like the lady. And when you're that, you're kind of racially passing as a white woman because you're of mixed background. So you can kind of pass up into the white world. Right. And now you start wearing very nice dresses and you act prim and proper. Um, but you can't really climb on things anymore. And the mechanics of the game change, um, or you can actually pass as a slave. Um, and you can kind of blend in with the slaves. If people are on your, uh, on your tail and you can kind of blend in and you start realizing, well, yeah, people don't actually look at slaves like people. They actually just, they're just kind of there. And there's this like, it's this very socially conscious content that isn't over in your face going, here's a message for you. It's, it's an interesting, fun game. And they built it into the game mechanics. Uh, I, I also think Papers, Please, um, which is an indie game, was my favorite game of last year, about being a um, kind of a border control agent on a Eastern Bloc country. They made as a made up country. Um, and it really codifies like ethnocentrism and nationalism because you start getting rules about like who you should let into the country and not. And you start really like judging other people from other countries who are probably racially the same as you, but they're not from the same country as you. So they're different. Right. And so now you start treating them kind of poorly. Uh, and I thought that was a really interesting game that tackled an issue uh, and made it really interesting and fun. Yeah. Well, I, I would also add, uh, you know, one, one of my favorite games of, of last year gone home when I think, and this is going to lead into my next question, that sort of you 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 explore, you learn through through letters and objects and audio and so like that. It's a way of of connecting to to a to a character and her her uh, her life and uh, you know and the relationship she has with others and who she is uh, and who she's developing into, and it it. The way that's presented, it's it's disarming, and uh, I, I think that's a, a, a it would be an interesting experience for someone who would who would 
maybe uh, consider themselves uh, homophobic and, and whatnot as a way to to understand where people, you know, where who they are and stuff in, in a way that isn't uh, confrontational. And, and so I want to get your opinion, uh, Manveer, about how how would you respond to you know those people who may disagree with certain injustices uh, perceived. Uh, what we perceive as injustice, uh, such as uh, marriage equality, you know, and you know, because of some, you know, they're they're they may be uh, it may not coincide with their religious beliefs and whatnot. Sure, I mean that's always a difficult subject because, frankly, I'm I'm an advocate for these sorts of things, and so I just think they're blanketly wrong. I'm I mean I'm I I think they're absolutely wrong and on the wrong side of history, but also being ethically and morally wrong. And that's a judgment call. Only like they probably think the same thing about me for uh, you know promoting gay rights and things like that. Um, and so that's actually kind of hard because part of me says I'm not trying to convince those people. They've kind of made up their minds. What I'm trying to convince the people is on the middle or who don't have a real thought on it, which is a lot of people, frankly, um, who just to see a fairer world, but. But to me, I don't necessarily feel the need to go uh, out of my way to go court or try to convince somebody, I guess, who might be what I would consider to be homophobic because of their religious beliefs or whatever um, that believes that that's a sin. You know, if they want to make a game that doesn't have that stuff or shows that it's a sin, they should have the complete right to do that. Uh, and we can have a discourse about it through our game mechanics and, and through the through you know blogs and media afterwards, and that's totally fine. Like to me, it's not about forcing anybody to change their content. Um, what it's about is looking at the pattern as an industry, right? And I, if if the pattern as an industry is we always do the same thing, that pattern needs to change. I don't need to. I can. It, it'd be stupid of me to just point at one game or one group and go, like, "You need to change." It's more of a bunch of us need to change. And some group of if some percentage of us do that, we're doing better. But like, frankly, with with, with somebody who just d- d- fundamentally morally disagrees with that, I don't know if you get anywhere on that conversation. It's like trying to have a religious debate over Christmas or something. It's not going to go anywhere good, in my opinion. Like, it's never turned out well. I've never convinced somebody um, that the way I think is correct on that or politics. Frankly, like like people are pretty entrenched in those beliefs, and they're they they come from a lot of from childhood and like, how they're brought up and things like that. Um, and I view that as kind of a waste of energy personally. If, if we're, if we're able to affect change and, and we see, see the, uh, developers change and, and sort of, so it's not the, you know, this great majority of, of white men, you know, we see more and more people coming over to, to answering that call and we're, we we are att- not attacking that, uh, we are answering those, those social, social injustices uh, in, through video games and whatnot. What, what's your idea with the what everything goes great? What's your idea of that the future might look like uh, in, in, in terms of video games and, uh, and that real world results? Um, I, I think you'll find a more creative medium that has a, a wider variety of interesting experiences to play as. So you'll, you won't have every single game being the Hollywood blockbuster or you save the world and the universe, right? You'll, you'll have more games that are like the gone home which is like a coming of age story but it just happens to be also a coming of age story and realizing you're gay um you'll have more experiences that people can relate to and so i think we'll have a better swath we'll have these indie games at the small end uh budget wise and we'll have triple a games at the large end uh budget wise and we'll have a lot of stuff in between and so therefore the consumer the 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 player can go well what interests me all right, I want to explode things and blow things up. Well, guess what? You know what? I'm going to guarantee you there's still going to be games where you blow up giant mechs and fall from the sky and shoot things in the face. That's still going to exist in this universe. It doesn't go away, nor should it go away. Um, you're still going to have the Titanfall 3 or 4 or whatever. You know, it will, will, will be there in 10 years. Um, but there'll also just be all these other... Hey, I don't care about that big, like, exploding stuff. I want to have this kind of heartfelt, intimate story like the Dear Esther's and the, the Gone Homes. Well, more of that will hopefully exist. And then we'll have that kind of bleed over where you have like that big budget game that tackles some of these issues. You can see things like the Bioshock games at least attempted to tackle those issues. It's debatable how well they did, but like you can see themes of, of race and, and um, economic equality and things like that in, in the Bioshock games. And I think those games are better um, for exploring 
exploring that that stuff and they have a more interesting kind of point of view versus again the the kind of the straightforward so i think we'll see a more creative medium i think we'll see a wider variety of games and that gives players choices and i think choices are what we need in this industry we need we need the ability to find games that represent us or that 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 draw us in more and that's the way we expand the art form as a, as a general so we go from just being uh, an art form of making the most mass market big budget things to kind of everything including that do you think it would also change those multiplayer experiences or or how gamers treat other gamers online so i mean there, there's evidence that shows that the way we treat each other in media uh, can affect our identity and how others treat us you know as i was studying before that's kind of sexual harassment study so slowly yes but that is also reinforced by the rest of culture, right? Like by film and TV and, and stuff like that. So I don't think that it just gets fixed. You know, people using the N word on Xbox Live is a normal thing, and it will probably, unfortunately, continue to be a normal thing. But what I do hope is that more people start understanding these issues, and they're going to have kids. And you know what? When you raise your kids, maybe that's something you mention. Like, hey, if you're going to play Xbox, these are the things that you don't say and here's why, right? Like most of those kids, and I'm saying kids because some of them are adults. So, so it's not fair to just point it all like, you know, some teenager just, you know, spouting off the wrong thing on Xbox. But there's a lot of us who are not told how to interact with other people on a social level. And it wasn't because our parents didn't care. It's just they didn't know how to have that conversation or it wasn't kind of a focus but you know i know if i had kids i would be like well if you're at a party with a girl you make sure you do and don't do these things right this this reinforces rape culture and this does this is okay and i would have that conversation with my child or especially a male child and i would think the same thing of of playing uh online games so i think we're doing our part to help the culture civilize or get better um and it, we can't fix it on our own, but we should at least fix our own house. You know, that was a big part of my talk is fix our own house. I have one last question myself, and I, Kelly might have a question. What your speech was aimed towards to to your own community developers and whatnot. What what are your suggestions that uh, what we as gamers uh, can do to to also affect change? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think the first thing is find the games that are doing the interesting things and support them financially by buying them and vocally by saying that this is interesting and this speaks to me and this is why, right? So if Gone Home really connected with you, uh, um, speak up about that because we are a copycat industry, sadly. And so when the powers that be, that be like see that everyone's drawing towards one trend, they start copying that trend and that you can use that to your advantage, um, and so to me, it's just about like being vocal about it. Unfortunately, the internet is far too vocal on the negative and not on the positive, and that's just sort of human nature. But if we understand that and we start you know, saying, here's a game that really spoke to me, and, and we tweet about it, and we say positive things, and we reinforce that, those, and we buy that, and it's, it's, it's monetarily a success because that frankly matters in the business world, then you'll see more games being made like that and you will see more people being rewarded for that so then they want to keep trying their unique voices in the world, right? Um, so to me, it's about support, finding the things that you care about in the industry, supporting them, searching them out, and then get also getting out of your bubble. If you only play the same handful of types of games, start following some new people on Twitter. Start like reading some new blogs that, that, that have things that challenge you that are different and give consideration to some of them. You know, if you're listening to this right now, you haven't played Gone Home or you haven't played Papers, please. Like, go try both of those games out. Like, I think for most people, they would really enjoy them. And they're really interesting games that have something unique to say. Or try Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation. Give these things an idea and think about how that affected the game experience and then talk about it vocally with other people. Like, we're a connected society now, thanks to the internet. Um, and. And, and that can really, really be powerful. Now, you know, we're talking about wanting to have more of these types of characters in video games. And the hope is that they're going to be positively depicted. One of my biggest fears, I guess, as a, as a female gamer is, you know, when it seems like when we get more female gamer or female characters within games, it's either the take the head off the male body and stick a female's head on it or a very enlarged chest. Um, how do we as, as gamers, you know, Chris was asking, how do we, you know, get these games to be more games made? How do we get them so the characters are quote unquote made 
so they're depicted correctly. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, what you're talking about is falling down on stereotypes, right? Like we fall, right. we, we fall down on these stereotypes. There's, there's far too many, you know, empowered women's origin the story being that they got raped, uh, and that's like it's it's an it's a trope at this point, right? It's not that that never it's never happened in the real world, but like that should not be the only way that a powerful woman exists in this world. Um, right. Again, I actually do think it's about speaking up about it. There's some blogs and stuff that basically start exposing, like, I saw one that was, like, ridiculous fantasy armor, right? And it's every time there's, like, skimpy fantasy armor for the female character. And they just, like, paste the picture on this Tumblr, and it, it goes up. And you're like, yeah, that makes no sense in a medieval setting. Like, why would you just be covering up the breasts and, like, the mid Like, a sword obviously would cut you. Like, that's just silly. Um, I think calling attention to it, starting a dialogue, um with people finding other people to kind of speak up as well, that that all matters and ask for better. If you, you can like problematic content, right? Like you can just go, this content is problematic, but I still like this game. You can have a game like grand theft auto five is a great game. It also has a really, really problematic depiction of trans people, trans women specifically in it. In it. Uh, that is quite terrible. In my opinion, I can still like grand theft auto five, but I can also call the developers out publicly and privately and say that you need to do better on this stuff because that that affects people and it affects how people think of themselves and it affects how people treat others. Well, you know, it seems like uh, being in the educational field myself, so many children are being impacted by these games, whether they should be at the ages that they are. There's not much we can do about that. That's a, a parental thing. But it's important, like you're saying, that they get exposed, that we as a society get exposed within our media content to correct depictions and not incorrect honest. depictions. Yeah, honest depictions. Yeah, honest depictions. Like I said, people are everything. So it's, it's going to come down to two steps, in my opinion. Because step one is we're underrepresented as, as women and racial minorities and, and uh, LGBT um, groups. Like that, that's all underrepresented. That is, like, there's no disputing it. So we have to first start by representing that more, more fairly in, in our games. Um, and then... What's inevitably going to happen is you could get a bunch of depictions that are all the same. You could get, well, we have a lot of gay characters, but they're all the flaming, stereotypical gay character. It's like, well, no, maybe let's not fall upon that. Like, maybe let's try not to fall on that stereotype. Let's try to, like, do what uh, The Last of Us did with Bill and, and even Ellie and, and, and create more fair characters um, to us. But here's the world I want to get in. I want to get to a place where... Our games depict the world that we know well enough in terms of representation numbers, right? And they don't have to be exactly one to one, but you know, I'm seeing you know gay characters all the time because guess what? I walk down the street and I see gay people all the time. Like some are, some are very effeminate and some are very, very you know you they look like me and you because guess what? They're like me and you. Um, and I, I would want to just be able to have have games where you could make the negative depiction of a character and a positive. De- depiction and it wouldn't really be a big deal because it wasn't overwhelmingly that the character was negative because stereotypes do exist for a reason uh you know they exist for a cognitive reason but they also they're based off something it's not like there's nobody like that but if if they're not the norm then we're in a good spot and so that then you can actually use a stereotype what what what, what would it would no longer be a stereotype at that point in the world and you would just think okay um, there's a very effeminately gay man uh, in, in this game, and I don't think anything of it. I don't think that's a negative depiction or overly negative because that's not the depiction I see every day in media in my life. That's a pipe dream. I don't know if we'll ever get there in media in general, but like, or at least in my lifetime. But that would be nice. Like, what, what, I would love that because then we actually can just make all the characters that we want and not have to actually actively sit here and think about, well, okay, what are all the negative tropes I'm falling upon when I make this violent, angry black man in my game? Like, am I doing the same thing? Every- yep. Oh, yep, I am. By the numbers, I'm absolutely doing the thing that everybody else does. I would like to uh, very quickly thank you and the rest of, uh, of the Bioware team for uh, Mass Effect. Uh, you know, that's been a, a, a great game that has also uh, a, a, ha, has addressed social injustices. You know, I've always, I've long respected the fact that you know we're we're dealing in in a future sense about humanity learning to uh, accept other other cultures and and other races, alien races and stuff, and and vice versa as well. And I thought that was a very, it, it really uh, spoke to me about uh, you know z- xenophobia in and, and uh, also managed to be a great third-person shooter uh, exploration and all that 
and uh, a lot of fun. Even even down to the um, fact that your the, the the multiplayer was was uh, cooperative. You know, I think was it was uh, one of the most appealing uh, things I, I found uh, 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 in in Mass Effect Three. So I wanted to thank you and the rest of Bioware for for your your guys' point your your guys' part in in all that. We don't need to bring up my effect with Mass Effect and huh. inabilities to climb ladders. Oh, yeah, your inability <laughs> to climb a ladder. I have Effect ladder or... issues with video games, just <laughs> in general. Well, yeah. Ladders are difficult, but I really appreciate the kind words. Like, you know, uh, we're all very proud of the series, and, you know, we look forward to continuing it in the future. So I'd like to thank uh, Manvir Hair, Hair for coming on the show. If you want to uh, follow uh, Manvir on Twitter, at M A N V. E E R H E I R, and uh, uh, once again, thank you so much, man, for for taking time of your very busy life and uh, going an hour without sleep to uh, join us here tonight. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Yeah, we really appreciate having this conversation. Now, Kelly. Yes. It's that time. Take us out. Don't forget, you can find us on our website at www.themarriedgamers.net. Also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the married gamers, where we try to have daily content for you to interact us with us with. Boy, there's a lot of whiffs. <laughs> um, also on Twitter, you can follow us at, at married gamers, follow lefty at lefty brown or myself at Mrs. Lefty Brown. We also have a Pinterest page. Um, it's Pinterest slash uh, married gamers. Uh, you know, pin, pin things that you like there that you want us to see. Repin what we've pinned. We like to see you guys and what you're doing on Pinterest. Please, yeah, check us out. Check there. us out there. It's a new adventure for me, all, the whole Pinterest thing. And uh, and don't we, pin we it have on your great clothes. Staff honey. Uh, working on that as well. Yes. As I try to get wrap my hand my head around what Pinterest is, but a lot of you guys like it. We've been noticing. Yeah, and and the whole idea of repinning, I don't, I don't get it, but apparently there's something about it. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, um, also. Uh, don't forget to, you can mail us at marriedgamers at outlook.com. And if you do, I promise to bring out my song. Oh, yeah. We're not going to talk about it. <laughs> uh, what we are going to talk about is uh, we have a exclusive Married Gamers app available for, available for $1.99 on most smartphones and tablets. And uh, we also have bonus episodes that will be starting up again here very soon. Yay. I'm so happy. Um that you can only hear if you own if 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 you own the app. So uh, uh, if you want to hear more about uh, what what we've been, I think we're working our way through the Alien series and yes. moving on to other stuff, but also topics. Got a lot stuff, of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Maybe um, you know what we should do yeah. Yeah. when we finish up the Alien series, the end of the the Alien series, we should pick like three things and ask our listeners to email us. What one they what like is yeah, the next thing well, they yeah, want to do for bonus content? I don't want content. it all to be about uh, uh, movies no, and stuff. No, but, no, but like you know, the next I, I, the I next like movie just, or whatever yeah, we do. Or yeah, yeah. Well, that's a possibility. But uh, so the the app is available for dollar ninety nine, and it helps us with server costs and all that sort of stuff. So uh, thank you to those who have already bought it, and I uh, hope you've been liking the uh, the app. So thank you very much. Next week we will be talking about VR gaming. You mean the thing that makes me sick? Yes, and I, we will be talking about how many uh, times Kelly will probably say that <laughs> it will probably make her sick. So uh, count it up. Hey, we should have a contest. We should. You know, we got how we many got, times we got a couple of things here we can give yes, away. Yeah. yeah. So how many times Kelly mentions getting sick on the show? Maybe we'll have a contest about that. So <laughs> this has been episode three hundred and thirty of the Married Gamers. Thank you so much for listening to to us, and we'll talk with you guys next week.